to do first, uh, welcome everybody. Um, we're just going to go over a couple of event guidelines. Then we'll, we'll get into the agenda. Um, I'll introduce myself, the topic that we're, we're here to discuss, and of course, introduce David. Uh, and then we'll get started. We'll start riffing. Um, so first and foremost, the event guidelines. So just so everyone knows this event is going to be recorded, but you're not going to appear in the video. Don't worry. Uh, if you didn't do your makeup, you didn't do your hair, you're all good. Um, and uh, everyone's muted during the event, just so you know. Uh, but feel free to engage like everyone is on the chat. Um, and if you have questions that you want to ask during the Q&A, highly recommend that you do that. Um, just don't use the chat for that. We have, there's a special Q&A window that you can use to ask your questions. Uh, that, then we'll, we'll have a group of people pick them and, and, and uh, they'll come up in the Q&A. So onto the event agenda. Um, so we're doing the introduction now. We've got about a 25 minute schedule uh, with some questions that I prepared for David about growing and scaling community. And then uh, we've got Q&A where we got a chance to take some of your questions. So that's how this is gonna go. Um, so let me just start by introducing myself. Um, I've been at Meetup for almost two years um, and I serve as a GM of Meetup Pro, uh, which is built on top of Meetup and it enables organizers and businesses to easily scale their communities. Um, and today we're here to discuss, you know, how the professionals approach the art and science of growing a community. Um, and we're gonna get into kind of some of the changing landscape and challenges facing community leaders at all levels today. Uh, whether you're at, at some, some, of, some of the giant customers that we have at Meta Pro, like, like Google, Microsoft, IBM, or you're, you're an everyday organizer and, and, and kind of, um, and, and are looking to this as an opportunity to see what professionals are doing um, and how to take that back to your community. Because at the end of the day, Everybody who's an organizer serves the role of the community manager, kind of regardless of the size of their group. So really excited today to be joined by David Spinks, uh, who's the founder and CEO of CMX. Um, pretty much everyone in the community management space has probably become familiar with CMX uh, over the years. But if you aren't yet, I kind of highly re uh, recommend that you uh, go to CMX Hub and kind of check out what they're all about. Um, they're the go-to place if you're looking to gain insights and, and into, into the trends of what's happening in community management, or you're looking to educate yourself in terms of uh, things like this, in terms of how, how, to, how to grow a community, how to scale a community, how to get started. Um, it, it's a really a fantastic resource. Um, in particular, we're looking forward to attending CMX Summit, which is in October, and it's the industry's largest community management event. So highly recommend that you take a look at that if you're interested. Um, in 2019, CMX was acquired by Bevy, uh, where David also serves as a VP of community, and Bevy is a leading provider in community software, and they, they, they power in-person and virtual event programs at some, of, some really great companies that have amazing communities like Slack, Twitch, Salesforce, Atlassian, Duolingo. Um, so they work with some really great communities over there. Um, on top of all that kind of, David is a three-time startup founder. Um, he's an experienced community executive, and he's personally advised and trained hundreds of organizations in community strategy over the past decade. So we've got the right person to chat today about this topic of growing and scaling community. So David, welcome to Meetup Live. Awesome. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Glad to be here. Yeah, great. Um, so so want to get started just with a little bit about you so people can get to know you a little bit better. Um, you know, you're obviously someone who's passionate about community to say the least. So you could say why? that. <laughs> so why? And, and, and kind of how did you end up building a career around community? Yeah, well, I'll try to keep it brief because I could talk about, I could talk about it all day, but I mean, you know, I, I think like, like a lot of community builders, I think it's rooted in uh, a struggle with the community at a really early age that made me uh, really focus on community and really care about people and and aiming to understand what makes someone fit in, what makes someone belong, what forms communities. Um, and so started building community online when I was in middle school, actually, for video games. Um, started a Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 community when I was like, 13 or 14. And that became okay. one of the largest communities for that game. Um, and we were running, you know, thousands of members and moderators and running online competitions and all this stuff out of my bedroom. My parents had no idea. 
that actually my parents just told me that they didn't know I was doing all that until they heard me talk about it in a speech I was giving recently. So I was wow. low key commu building community online. And then um, just, just became really fascinated with how technology could connect people in new ways and joined a lot of social platforms at their very early stages. Um, started writing about it when I was in college. I started a blog. Uh, a company read my blog where I was just kind of writing about my philosophies and what I was seeing in terms of community and technology. And they were like, hey, would you want to come be our community manager for the summer? We're in an accelerator program and we need someone to build our community from the ground up. So I said, sure. I uh, flew to Philly right after I graduated from college and spent three months building a community for this startup called Scribnia. Um, and that was my first official community manager job. And that was the first time I was paid by a company to build a community. And I was blown away. I was like, holy shit, like people pay you to, to build community? Like this could be a real job? It felt surreal. Um, and I was like, cool, I'll like learn, you know, how to do this stuff. I'll find some trainings. I'll find mentors. I'll try to figure, I'll like start getting better at this. And when I started looking for that information, I looked for those resources there really just wasn't anything out there. There was no one that was teaching you how, to, how do you build a community for a business? How do you build communities online? How do you build communities at scale? That information just didn't exist and there was no network for it. There was nowhere to get that support. And so I spent most of my career building community for companies and just kind of figuring it out as I went. Um, and that ultimately led to starting CMX uh, six years ago as basically the thing that I wish existed when I started in the industry. Uh, wanting to bring together everyone who's doing this work and provide them with the resources, the training, the education, the connections that they need to be successful. That's awesome. I think that's a great introduction. And and also, I think there's probably a lot of community managers or even organizers on Meetup out there that kind of see themselves in your story a little bit and hopefully are getting inspired about what what could be um, in, in, the, in the future. Um, so, we're here to talk about growing a community, but, but I think that there are a couple of, obviously there's a lot happening in the world today and there's a few interesting trends that I think we should touch on first. And, and obviously the first one is the elephant in the room right now, which is uh, the pandemic. Um, one trend that we've noticed with the professional communities is kind of a shift to hybrid events, which are in-person events that are kind of simultaneously streamed online. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, if you've seen that, um, and if there are any kind of new realities that you think have sticking power that aren't just here for the pandemic and then will go away, but will actually just change the way the communities convene uh, because of the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, first and foremost, like I think the pandemic has shown us just how important community is, right? Like, it, it, if you struggle to explain to someone why this is important work before now it's it's just plainly obvious like seeing the struggle that that people have when they're isolated from each other and not able to interact whether that's with their more intimate friends and family or on a broader scale like interacting and in, and existing in a society like when we can't get together uh it, it it breaks the whole system it breaks what it means to be a human so i think on the other side of this we're going to see just a whole new level of appreciation for community and people are going to be craving community in, in a bigger way. That all said, humans are extremely adaptive. And so, you know, after, you know, uh, maybe a, a week or two of mourning the loss of being able to see anyone in person, uh, community builders started getting creative very quickly in organizing virtual events that, you know, in some ways attempt to replicate the experience you might have in person. Um, and we're seeing where that breaks, right? We're seeing where that's not really possible. Uh, you all organize events. You know that the magic of events are often in the kind of unplanned serendipity that happens and the connections that are made when you just pass someone in a hallway or you happen to strike up a conversation with someone before or after the talk. Like that's where the magic happens. And that serendipity is really hard to find in an online space. Um, you know, like, look at this event, right? Like people are gonna, they can chat, but like, they're not gonna like strike up a deep conversation with another member unless, unless you facilitate that. And so we're seeing community organizers start to figure out how to facilitate more intimate 
um, more guided, more facilitated discussions in a virtual setting. Um, and, and so, you know, it's like, I, I think absolutely what we're going to see at the other end of this is, is the hybrid approach. We're going to see, I think people are going to get back to meeting in person probably too soon, which is like what we're already seeing around the world is people are like a little too comfortable getting back together in person. But I think we will see kind of more intimate events come back relatively quickly as soon as people feel safe doing so. Um, but I don't, now that we've seen the light of virtual events and the power of virtual events, like they're, they're infinitely scalable, right? We can have 200 people watching this now. We can have a thousand people watching this now. We can have 10,000 people watching this now. And we don't have to pay for a bigger venue with more seats and more food and all the things that come with an in-person event. So they're infinitely scalable. They're much more accessible right? People can join events from all over the world, from any location. Most virtual events have become free events that otherwise, you know, we would charge, like we charge $700 for our conference ticket. Usually this year, we're giving it away for free for CMX Summit. And so we're expecting, you know, a 10x increase in size of the amount of people who will be at that event. Um, and so it just creates a lot more opportunities and, and, um, spaces where you can create these touch points for your community. And on the other end of this, I think, yeah, it's going to be both. We're going to have in-person, we're going to have online gatherings. We're seeing a whole lot of technology come out now that's really innovative and figuring out how to make this whole experience better. Like already this, this whole like Zoom thing is starting to feel uh, outdated a little bit. And we're seeing all this new innovation come up already. And how do we replicate that in-person experience? How do we use uh, space between each other, right? Like I just learned about a platform that you have an avatar and literally as you move closer to another person, the audio starts getting more clear and the video starts getting more clear, right? Or, or how do you replicate the experience of sitting in a circle with a group of people rather than just seeing a grid of people's faces? So there's all these things that we're already seeing a lot of innovation around that um, I think after coronavirus, we're just going to see a much more capable uh, virtual event experience available to community builders. R really interesting. Um, you know, an another trend that's that started recently is is just looking at how kind of big brands are approaching their go to market strategy, and and how community fits into that. Um, right now, social media is is kind of on the hot seat if you will, the, the, I, I just counted recently, there, there are 43 brands that have publicly boycotted advertising on, on, on Facebook right yeah. now. And, and so I'm curious to hear your thoughts about where does community fit into the, the kind of CMOs playbook and, um, and, and how do you think that's changing? Yeah. So, um, so I think there's like multi levels to that question and, and I mean, if you zoom out, there's like three macro trends happening right now. We have coronavirus that has completely shifted how we engage with each other and connect. Uh, we have, at least in America, there's a Black Lives Matter movement, which I think has, has spread around the world and, and an attention to diversity and inclusion in our communities. And then we're seeing this, um, and, and not unrelated to those things, we're seeing this kind of um, exhaustion point that people are hitting with big social and the toxicity that they're finding on those platforms and the divisiveness that they're finding on those platforms, um, mainly Twitter and Facebook. And so, um, yeah, I think what we're seeing and what we're going to see in this next year is a massive shift back to uh, more independent, more moderated, more curated communities. People are craving a space where somebody has some accountability and responsibility for maintaining the culture in that space. And they're exhausted by these just completely unmoderated spaces that um, you, know, you might be attacked in, uh, you might be, um, you, you just get pulled into these kind of negative news cycles, and then you show up in a nice curated independent community space and it's like a breath of fresh air to a lot of people right now. And so I think that's like the, the, those three macro trends are moving people into seeking more indie communities. And for the CMO or for the business, that represents a massive, massive opportunity. 
because you're seeing people crave that. And a business, every business has a brand, um, some, some sort of uh, category that they're working in, whether it's like B2B and they're offering a software product that people use, or it's B2C and it's, it's a product around music or art or you know, something in people's lives. And so now a business has an opportunity to create the community space that people are seeking. And if you as a business are able to create that space for people, it represents, you know, this incredible opportunity to, you know, the, the table stakes are that like people will feel more loyal and more, um, uh, you know, you'll be able to retain your customers more as a business. But the real opportunity is when people feel like they're a part of a community, they want to contribute to that community. And so, you know, they want to self-organize events. They want to self-organize community. They want to give you product feedback and ideas. They want to contribute content. They want to become leaders in the community. And so that's a lot of the work that we're doing today with businesses is helping them really see this opportunity and understand why building community is no longer this like fluffy, feel good, nice to have thing. Um, it's yes, it's really good for humans and people and you can do it very meaningfully and authentically. And it can drive some incredible growth numbers and opportunities for businesses to, to expand their business, to, to scale up all of their operations and their growth. Really helpful. Um, so let's transition into growth then. And, and, and since we're on the topic of kind of the, the, the professional space, you know, how, how do professional community managers who are maybe starting a community strategy at, at a company, how do they get started uh, and kind of start one from, from scratch? Is, is, there, is there a process or best practices that you recommend? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a big question. So, um, yeah, like how do you build a community? Um, yeah. Uh, we have a lot of frameworks that you can use for that. Um, you know, one, one of the tools we have is called the seven P's of community. So you can look that up, but that basically breaks down a community strategy for you into people, uh, purpose. So like, who are you gathering? Why are you gathering them? Place, where are you gathering them? Participation is what they're doing in that space. Policy is how they should participate. Like what are the rules or guidelines in that space? Um, promotion is how you're growing it. And then performance is how you're tracking success. Right. So you can use that as a very simple framework for kind of mapping out or designing your community experiences. Um, you know, you have to kind of think about where you are as a business or an organization in the first place. So if you already have a really large established audience and people already love your product, then you have that foundation of trust already that you can turn into a community. So, you know, if you have a thousand uh, customers and they already trust you, then, you know, the step one would be to just identify who are the most engaged, most motivated, most loyal customers, and just start creating spaces to bring them together and help them help each other, right? That, that's the difference between community and audience. Uh, audience, you're trying to help people, right? You create content or a product and you build your audience. Community is about helping people help each other. So what are the problems that the people, that your customers, whoever it is, has? It could be partners, it could be employees, anyone that you're trying to bring together, what are the problems they have and how can they help each other with that problem? And who in the community is motivated to help the other members of that community solve that problem? And you start in, in smaller experiences, you build the foundation of community with the right people and the right content, because once you create, kind of, it's kind of like a center of gravity, you create like a really strong core of community, then other people feel attracted to it and they wanna be involved, they wanna get into that community. What I wouldn't do is say like, hey, we're launching a community, invite all 1000 people to your space all at once. Um, that's not very facilitated, it's not very intentional, and you miss an opportunity to create that strong kind of dense core. Um, then if you are a company that doesn't have an established audience yet, then you know, you're really starting from scratch. And, and you kind of want to be building both, I think, simultaneously. You want to be building up your audience. And it's essentially, again, it goes back to trust. Like if people don't trust you, then they, they're not going to trust you when you say, hey, come join our community. So you can earn that trust by building one-on-one -on -one relationships and doing things that don't scale at first. You can do it by sharing content and education that's really useful for people. So they start to recognize you as an expert and they trust you that way. Um, and you just start to bring the right people together again 
um, in small experiences. I think like starting small is actually really critical to building a big community. To start small and like essentially find like community market fit. Um, and once you find that, then you can replicate that. And, and then eventually the only true way to scale your community is to um, essentially distribute authority. So you're saying, great, we figured out this event or this experience that really works. And now we're going to start distributing authority to our most active members so they can self-organize those events or they can create those experiences for each other. And that's how communities like really expand very quickly. That's fascinating. I think that that last bit is, is, is really, it's like the gasoline on, on the fire, but you also have to have something that works first and you have to build that, that, uh, that small thing that exactly. is clearly working before you can decide to scale it. And I, I, I imagine just like building a business or creating a product, you can scale too soon and, and, and th that can go, go really wrong. Yeah, you, you can always fake growth. The same with a business. You can always buy new members and new users and new customers, right? Like you can do that, but authentic organic growth, yeah, you, you can't fake that. And, and if you try to throw gasoline on a flame that's too small, it's just going to douse it, right? So you need uh, a pretty, you know, strong, hot flame going so that when you do add the gasoline to it, then it can, it can spread. So I think that distributing authority insight is, is, is probably really interesting to a lot of people in the audience. Um, and in that it, it, it's, it's a way to take you as the community manager who can only do so much. You're only 24 hours a day. You only have so much you can do and kind of delegate the work to, to, to others so that it can really scale. So how, how, do, how do some of the best uh, communities do that? Yeah, I mean, and that's key, right? And like, how many times have we seen the, the solo community manager just get spread so thin? Because, I mean, building a community, you think about all the elements of building a community and like growing the community, welcoming new members, um, enforcing policies and moderating, creating new experiences, facilitating. And then if you're working in a business, you're probably also doing all these other things that aren't core to community. And you're responsible for translating the community's needs to the business. So now you're working with marketing and product and sales and everyone else. And then you have to translate what they all want back out to the community. So, I mean, it's just so many balls and so many hats um, to wear. And, and so, yeah, I mean, the only way to truly scale it is to delegate. And it's the same as anything else in business, right? Like if you are managing everything, you are the bottleneck to growth. And how do you break that bottleneck? You delegate, you trust other people to own things. And so in a community, that can take a lot of forms. That can take somebody hosting events, right? CMX, we have 60 chapters around the world. And every one of those chapters is run by a volunteer member of our community who said, I want to bring CMX to Madrid. And we, get, we create a playbook, right? So like having the playbook is important because you, you want to teach them how to be successful. You don't want them to have to like figure anything new out necessarily. You want to like, make it as easy as possible for them to use a playbook, get their community going and be successful. Um, and so it's, it's kind of like giving them guide rails. And so it's like, stay within these guide rails, but within here you have autonomy and control to be creative and try new things. And, and that's where the real magic happens is because your community members will start to create things that you never even thought of. And then if you see something that works, then you add that to the playbook. Right. If our Madrid chapter leader um, figured out a great way to do virtual events, which actually happened, like they were one of our first chapters to go virtual really quickly with their chapter. We're like, oh, shoot. Like we thought our program was dead when uh, no one could gather in person. But then they started um, doing virtual and then they told the other hosts about it. And all of a sudden everyone was doing virtual events. And we're like, wow, this is amazing. It's a community taking that lead. Um, I mean, there's countless examples of this being done really well. I mean, you know, for events, you can look at a company like Duolingo. They have a two or three person community team running 2,600 events a month. Amazing. Like Amazing. insane scale. Um, so what, what's, in it, what's in it, what's in it for the, for the, uh, the person you're delegating the authority to? What, what, why would why they want to take all of this responsibility on? Why does anybody want, you know, community or want, want to be a leader? It's because um, they see it as an opportunity for growth for themselves and it's a community that they care about and they want to contribute to. So it, it's, it's social dynamics and social hierarchies, right? It's like 
if I'm a member of a community, um, I want to improve my status in that community because it's a group of people that I care about. I care about how they see me. Um, and and um, so, you know, for us, our hosts get an opportunity to be the leader of the community industry in their city. Um, they get they get benefits and perks and stuff from our program, but that's not why they do it. It's, it's a, it's a deeper intrinsic motivation that they will benefit greatly in their careers, in their work, in their network by being the leader of their local community. Um, Duolingo, it's less about career. So Duolingo, they're an example where, um, their users, uh, Duolingo is a language learning app. If you're not familiar with it, so you can learn all different languages and their users wanted to practice their language with each other. And so they started empowering their community members to self-organize events where you can go and practice your language with each other. So there it's less about like a career growth, but it's like, I wanna practice my language and I wanna meet other people who are also practicing this language um, and form relationships and, and form friendships. And so that will drive people to wanna to interact with each other more and, and take on that leadership role. Um, and it just, you know, it feels good. It's like a good thing to do to bring community to other people. Like every single person watching this who's building a community knows how good it feels to build community. Like there's no better feeling for me in the world than getting to an event that I organize or help to organize and seeing people show up in this space and interact and be happy and connect and then hearing years later that the two people that connected with each other at that event ended up like, launching a project together or that led to them getting a job or led to an opportunity and like that's the most rewarding feeling in the world in my opinion and so i think that's really what drives people to want to build community there's something special about when people get together and they're intrinsically motivated and it doesn't always have to be so forced and incentivized and i think you kind of know it when you see it and that, that, that that's really cool and i imagine some of the best communities are kind of meeting around around that those dynamics um, yeah. Something, something I, I wanted to get into now, we talked a bit about how to grow a community and how to, how to start small and then how to get big by, by delegating the responsibility and, and giving out authority. But when, whether you're your own boss or whether you're working for a big brand that has a lot of other different departments that want to get the most out of your community, uh, there comes a point where demonstrating return on the investment and the time that it took to build that community becomes important. So how do you recommend that organizers demonstrate the value of their community, whether it's to themselves or to their boss? Yeah. So, um, and it's, it's a good segue from what your, your point that you just made, because like, like both things are true. Yes. A community has to be authentic and it has to be built on intrinsic motivation for it to truly be a successful, healthy, engaged community. And a community has to be financially sustainable. And I know you've seen this. I know probably everyone in here has experienced this where you can have the most authentic community in the world, but if you can't justify continuing to invest your time and resources and money and energy into building that community, you will burn out and the community will end up failing or shutting down. And so, um, like, I, I, I have a belief that essentially like businesses are communities and communities are businesses. Every business is essentially a community, right? It's a shared brand, shared identity, common purpose. Uh, people feel a strong sense of belonging in a business. Uh, everything, all the dynamics that, that you see in a community, symbols, language, uh, you know, inside jokes, everything, uh, you see that in a business. So a business is a community and a community is a business because at the end of the day, it's a, it's a institution where people are contributing time and energy and, and it needs to be financially sustainable in order to, at, at the bare minimum, continue to exist and at best be able to grow, right? And if you're a business investing in community, you have to see what the value is to the business. Because if it's just a nice to have, if it feels good, great, that, that, that sounds nice. Um, and like, yeah, maybe we'll keep doing it, but it's never going to get the continued investment that other parts of the business, like marketing and sales that can show directly how it's impacting the business will get, because if your CMO isn't able to say for every dollar we put in, we're getting $2 out or we're getting more than a dollar back, 
then it's not a growth engine. It's a cost center. And so it's really important. And a lot of the work that I do is, is to help businesses really see and help community teams really see how community can drive uh, a sustainable growing business. Um, and so that's whether you're running your own community and you want to turn your community into a business that's earning you income or you're building community for a business and you're driving those outcomes. Um, and so if, if it's your community and you're trying to turn the community into a business, then like there's some pretty standard ways that you can drive revenue uh, through your community. Like the simplest ways to charge for membership or charge for a premium level of membership. So maybe it's free but you have a premium event or a premium content or some access that people get that they pay a subscription for. Um, you could do partnerships and advertising. So who are the companies that want to reach your community and, and how do you charge them for that access? You can offer a product to your community members. So what's a problem that they have that you think you can build a product for, maybe a software product or a physical product that solves a problem for the, your community because your community is an incredible distribution channel for a product. Um, so there's all these different mechanisms you can use to, to essentially turn your community into a business. Um, for building community for a business, um, community actually impacts every part of a business. Um, and so I look at it as an extension of your team. So you have a marketing team, you can build a community that's an extension of your marketing team. You have a a product team, you can build a community that's an extension of your product team. And the community helps grow through marketing, the community helps grow through product. Um, the model we use for this is called the space model. We've actually updated it to the spaces model, but we haven't shared that publicly yet. So if you Google the space model, or we can share it here in the chat, um, it stands for the, dif the different areas that community drives value for a business. So you have support, which is your customers support, supporting each other, answering questions for each other uh, around the product, right? So you're reducing support costs, you're increasing customer retention. Product is where your community is sharing ideas and feedback that you are contributing to the product to help you innovate. So community members are sharing ideas, voting on each other's ideas, um, discussing the things that they wanna see to improve your product that helps you innovate more quickly. Acquisition is growth. So um, you're running community programs, online community programs or event community programs that is reaching new people, new, reaching new prospects, reaching new leads and, and bringing new customers into your business. Um, and my friend, Mary Thingval, we just did a, a podcast episode. She has a great uh, terminology for it, just community qualified leads. So there's sales qualified leads, there's marketing qualified leads, which means like someone came through marketing and now that means they're qualified as a potential customer. Sales is even more qualified because you've like interacted with them as a, as a sales team. Um, and you use those lead scoring terminologies, those lead scoring systems to basically look at like all the people that you have touch points with and say, here are the high priority people that we should focus on because they have the best chance of becoming a customer. So high lead, high lead scoring from all these touch points, add community to that. So now you have these community qualified leads, which means they've interacted in your event, they've interacted in your community, they've interacted in, in some sort of experience you've done with the community, and you could use that as a way to kind of measure how community impacts pipeline. Um, the, the fourth one is uh, content and contribution. So your community is contributing the content that makes up um, either a project that you have, or it could be your entire platform, right? Like meetup, all the meetups are hosted by the community, Airbnb, all the apartments are provided by the community, Wikipedia, all the editing is done by the community. So content and contribution is what the community is contributing to that business. Fifth, you have engagement. So that's customer retention and customer experience. So by building community for people, you're improving their customer experience and, and driving that customer retention. And then the fifth, the sixth one we added to spaces is success. So that's where commu your community members are teaching each other and educating each other to make each other more successful at using your product and make each other more successful in their careers, right? So you have support, product, acquisition, contribution, engagement, and success. It's the space or spaces model. And so that can be a very clear way of understanding why you're not just building community for the sake of community because the CMO doesn't care about that. They're not going to go to their board meeting and say, hey, we had, you know, a lot of people came to our event. We had a great attendance rate. A lot of people post in our community. Like, 
They don't care about that. They care about, so what? So they, they participate in our community. And as a result, it drove this outcome for our business. And those are the six outcomes you can point to. I love it. I think the space model and now the spaces model is a great framework to think about. Now you've got this flourishing community. Here's I can, how I can demonstrate the ROI and how I can, I can get it uh, adding value to my business or my organization. And everyone here on Meetup Live, you heard that, that second S first. So uh, you always get insights here on, on Meetup Live. So thanks for sharing that. We've got some amazing questions from the audience that I want to get into now. Awesome. Um, so let's, let's transition over there. Um, so Andy Stanberry uh, asks, uh, so how do you reproduce the hallway experience with a virtual event? So that's something you were talking about a bit in terms of what you don't get typically in a virtual event. Yeah. What, what are some ways that people are tackling that? No one's figured it out yet, I would say. Um, I think there's some interesting plays at it right now. Um, one is a cool called Icebreaker. So Icebreaker essentially does speed networking. So everyone can join in and then you get randomly matched up with another person who's at the event for a predetermined amount of time. It could be three minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, whatever you want to set it. And, and so they get an opportunity to like meet a lot of other people at the event for one-on-one -on -one conversations and they give you these like card prompts that can fuel your discussion. So um, it's more, it's not completely like, um, uh, it's, not, it's not the same thing as like running into someone in a hallway, but it can create serendipity by like, you never know who you're gonna meet and, and be able to have a great conversation with. Our community loves speed networking when we do it online. It's like their favorite thing in our events because at the end of the day, they really just wanna talk to each other um, uh, a little bit more facilitated would be to do breakout rooms or discussion groups. So, and so, you know, let's say after this, if we wanted to, we can break everyone, all 200 people out into, you know, 20 different discussion groups with 10 in each. And, and all of you can talk about, um, about how to grow your communities. And now you have an opportunity to like talk to 10 people or even less, ideally like six people's perfect because now you get to like, all right, I'm getting to know six other people in a more deep way and I can follow up and form those relationships. Um, and then we get some more innovative things. Like I said, there's, there are people who are creating more of a virtual world so you can move around the world and actually like run into people in the same way. I haven't seen any of those work well yet. I think maybe Burning Man will try some interesting things there and we'll see how that goes. Cool. Um, and what, one last thing I'll share is there's, there's a cool idea around, I don't know if you've been following Clubhouse, which is a lot of drama and there's a lot of things they're not doing well, but it's basically like audio only rooms that people can just like join and start chatting. And I, I really like that idea as like a white labeled option to offer to communities. So imagine if you just had like, people can just spring up lots of different rooms and it's audio only. So it's like low barrier to entry and you can just go in and start talking about things or just listen to others. Um, could be another cool way to just create serendipity. Very cool. Very cool. Just something to, for the audience. Um, I know this is scheduled for 45 minutes. We've got a lot of great questions. So we're going to go uh, a few minutes over. Um, but if you do have to jump off early, this is recorded and we're going to be posting it uh, on, on the meetup blog, meetup.com slash blog, where you can get, uh, you know, you'll be able to access the recording afterwards. Um, so let's get into our, our next question. Um, and, and by the way, everyone in the audience, feel free to keep uh, jumping in and posting more questions in the Q&A uh, tab in the, in the Zoom button on the bottom. Um, so Rashmi uh, Nagendran asked, do you have a motivational message for a young community professional who is wholly learning through online resources and has no mentor in the field? Motivational message. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I think like, there's no more important work to be doing today. And I think there's only gonna be a, a, a ton more opportunity to build community and build a career in community over the next five to 10 years. Um, and the beauty of this space, if you're new to it and you don't know anyone in it is, I mean, one, that there's, it's very easy to learn actually because you all you do to learn is join communities and and start taking notes on the communities that you love and what people are doing that seems to work really well there um and the other thing that's really easy to do is to start your own community the barrier to entry to starting your own community is very 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 low and so throughout my career uh whenever i had a problem 
building a community was my solution to that problem. Um, when I just graduated from college and I, I had no idea what the hell I was doing, I ended up starting, it was the, I think we were the second ever Twitter chat that existed on Twitter called U30 Pro. And every week I would host it. It started with like 10 people joined. Um, and then it just grew by like another 10 and another 10. Pretty soon we had hundreds of people, all young professionals and mentors joining this Twitter chat every week where I would come up with five questions, put it out every like 10 minutes and people would just answer and discuss the answers to those questions. And that became an incredible way for me to learn. It also became an incredible way to build my network and build my reputation. And so, you know, you want to learn sales, your code, you know, it, you really have to like do that work a lot. Um, and maybe you have to get hired to do it. Some Well, code has, is pretty accessible. Let's say you want to do sales. Like you kind of have to be hired to do sales. Community, you don't need anyone to hire you to build community. You can just start doing it today. I love it. That's, uh, that's both inspiring the heart and also inspiring the mind that, hey, this is something that's really accessible and, and, and a lot, lot less barriers to entry than a lot of other fields. So that's, that's cool. Um, all right. Ariel uh, Sullivan asks, uh, so please share uh, with us some more details around this new event tech. Uh, where can we go to learn more? Yeah. Um, so where can you go to learn more? Well, one, um, we, we have a few articles that you can go to. So um, there's, there's an article I published on first round review. Um, is, I have to remember the name. It's like how to pivot your, uh, vir to pivot to virtual or how to pivot your event strategy to virtual. I list a bunch of tools and advice and things for virtual events there. Um, maybe if someone can find it and, and post it in the chat here, we can link to that. Um, and we also have a, a comprehensive guide to pivoting to virtual events on cmxhub.com. Um, so you can go there and that has lots of tools listed there as well and lots of tips. Um, there's also a spreadsheet that has been developed uh, that's in our community somewhere. Um, I'll have to find it. Maybe we can like send it out in the show notes afterward or something, but the community just started sharing all the virtual tools and there's like over a hundred in the spreadsheet that you can look through. Um, and yeah, so, um, lots of really interesting things going on, interesting things going on. I, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't mention as well that you should check out Bevy, um, cause we have a virtual event offering that, that we offer as well. Um, so you can actually host your events virtually on Bevy now. And we're doing some really cool creative things there as well that I'm excited about. We can't share all the details yet, but we're like being, it's really exciting to be able to be creative in, in how to solve some of these questions around creating a more you know, intimate community space online. So uh, take a look there at bevy.com. Awesome. Great. Okay. Uh, Brian McDaniel asks, um, what can I say to members who like in-person events but don't think online events are worth it? Uh, my meetup groups depend a lot on in-person experiences. Yeah, look, I mean, it's not going to be for everyone. Um, for some people, like the in-person is what's going to make it uh, more valuable. I, I was a skeptic too. Like at first I was like, I'm not going to go to a single online event. Uh, and, I, and when we, we, had, we ended up hosting a conference called CMX Global, we had 3,000 people at that event, I was very skeptical going in. I was like, this is gonna not feel great. Like it'll feel just like a big webinar. Um, but I was, I was wrong. Like the community showed up and it had such a awesome vibe. And that's a testament to Anne Marie, who's here in the chat on my team. She, she led that event and she leads CMX Summit. And you can be very intentional in, in online events and still create a very, warm, positive, welcoming, engaging vibe. Um, and so, you know, it's, 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 it's about experimentation and figuring out what's gonna resonate with your community. Um, some people are not going to engage with it. They're not gonna love it. And then other people are gonna love it and maybe even like it more than in person because maybe, you know, we, we've had like introverted members of our community who are like, this is great. I get to like engage and learn and do all this stuff and I don't have to talk to anybody. Um, so, uh, just kind of recognize that it's going to be a different experience for everyone. Um, and, and there's no like one way to switch your events from offline to online. 
uh, what I'd recommend doing is, is going back to first principles. So the mistake I think a lot of organizers make is they say, well, we had this offline experience. How do we replicate it online? I don't think you can do that. You can't replicate in person. You just aren't going to, it's just different. And so going back to first principles means if we were to build this experience today from the ground up online, what are the things that we would do to make it valuable? What would our members want? What would our attendees want? Uh, what problems would we solve? Um, what experiences can we create with it, you know, 100% being designed for online? So essentially like start from scratch and rethink what an engagement looks like for your community when they gather online instead of offline. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Deanne uh, Rasse, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, or Raves asked, do you have any tips on what to do for the hundreds uh, who have signed up for our group, uh, but don't show up at, 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 at my events when we did live? Yeah. Um... I mean, there's always going to be a drop off there. We see about, you know, 40 to 60% RSVP to attendee rate. So usually it's only about half of the people that RSVP for a virtual event will actually show up. Um, can be less, can be more. So some of that is just like, it's going to happen, especially for free events. Um, but, you know, one thing you can think about is how do you keep people engaged in between events? So if you're only relying on them coming to an event as the only way to engage with the community, you're missing out on a big opportunity to create a deeper sense of engagement and commitment for those members. Um, you can be prompting discussions in between events. You can be facilitating Q and A's. You can um, offer alternative spaces for people to gather and connect in between events. Um, you can also go bigger, right? Like, Right now, it's like almost, it's so easy to just be like, we're hosting an event and it's going to be on Zoom and we're going to have a guest, like come join. Um, what can you do to kind of go above and beyond and, and like stand out from all the other events that are out there and make it really feel compelling? And that's how you design the event. That's literally like graphic design that you build around it. It's the caliber of content and speakers. It's the facilitation to be able to say like, we're not just going to have a speaker. We're also going to do discussion groups or speed networking or all these kind of other experiences. Um, so just like other people will tell you like, oh, well, you can email them more or notify them more. Like, yeah, you can do that and you'll probably get your numbers up. But really what you want to, what you want to be doing is seeing people come back to your event over and over again and bringing new people and seeing new people on top of that. So you're seeing recurring attendees and new attendees month to month or week to week or however often you're organizing it and you're tracking that going you want to see those numbers going up over time makes sense sorry for the background noise my neighbors are really enjoying the pool but it's like a funnel and marketing <laughs> Sounds fun and 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 people start at the top and not everyone always converts to rsvping or going to the event and it's important not to get discouraged about that so i think that's an important message yep. um another uh great question here from deborah crawford so this goes back to how to how, how to how do communities engage outside of events. So so how do you encourage member engagement with polls and discussion boards? Communication is all one way for me at the moment. I have a very small community and trying to find out what uh, uh, how to spark that kind of discussion between events. Yeah. So great question. Um, that's we could do an entire hour long call on just how to build, you know, online community and engagement. Well, one, one like fun way that you can think about creating more diversity of experiences for your community. This is a, a framework I use in my trainings and workshops is um, just like write out across the top of a piece of paper, annual, quarterly, monthly, weekly, and daily. Write it out across the top. And then under each of those, write, three to five ideas for what you can do to gather your community or create something for your community on each of those time frames. So annually, what can you do once a year? Maybe it's like a big global gathering. So, you know, generally like the farther apart the experience is, the, the more produced and the bigger production it is. So, you know, what can you do once a year to bring your community together? What can you do every three months that brings your community together or brings them some sort of value? Um, what can you do every month? Maybe that's when your meetup is, is every month. What can you do every week? Maybe, you know, in our community, 
Um, we use rituals every week, which is a really great way of keeping people engaged online. So every Monday we do um, a new member welcome thread and we tag all of our new members and we welcome them into the community and everyone responds to their introductions. Um, we do a weekly promo thread where people can share things that they've launched or things that they've worked on. Um, we do a Friday fun day where we just have like a fun, like share the last picture in your phone and, and the story around it um, or some sort of fun game. We do a monthly jobs thread that where everyone can share jobs and opportunities. So creating those kind of recurring rituals is a really great way for keeping people engaged. And then daily might just be like, all right, every day I'm going to ask one question in the community to prompt a debate or a discussion that gets people to engage. Um, and, and like a little, like a little tweak is a kind of a pro tip for getting people to discuss a topic. Instead of asking them uh, to kind of answer uh, either or question, um, take a stance and then ask them to agree or disagree. So, you know, it's a silly example would be like, instead of being like, um, you know, apple, do you like apple pie or pecan pie? You would say like, apple pie is the best pie, discuss, right? And then it forces them to either take the side of like, apple pie is the best or apple pie is not. And it creates more of an opportunity to have a debate and a discussion um, in a healthy way, right? It's not about creating conflict, it's about like, getting people to kind of have a healthy disagreement. So that, that's a little thing that you can use to get people to like engage with the topic um, more, more deeply. Pecan pie is definitely the best pie. For sure, but <laughs> See, I, you I responded. Really, <laughs> you, couldn't, exactly. you couldn't not respond. <laughs> <laughs> I love that framework. We're getting a lot of virtual head nods in the chat about that framework too. So that sounds like it was a, it was a great point. Um, we got one more question that I want to ask and then we can wrap up. Um, so start scrappy at, uh, I love the name, by the way, uh, what do you see with Bevy and otherwise uh, the, the, the attendee versus RCP rate for in-person versus online? So you mentioned online, but what about, how does that differ from in-person? Yeah, I mean, I, I expected it to be a much lower percentage rate because it's so much easier to sign up for an online event. Um, that I, ex because that barrier to entry is so low, I expected there to be much more drop off, but it turns out it's also much easier to attend the event. So where we'd see a lot of people sign up for our free meetups and we generally see about 40% show up to our events, you know, because it's like, all right, like it was free to sign up. That was easy, but actually, you know, going to an event when I just want to go home and see my kids or I want to go home and take a nap, um, that, that drop off ended up being more. So we're actually seeing a higher turnout rate for our virtual free events than we have for our in-person free events. Um, and I'm just talking about free events. You start charging people, your numbers will go right up, right? Like the number of people signing up will go down, but the percentage of people who show up will go up. But for free events, um, in person we saw about 40%. Uh, online we're seeing anywhere from like 60 to 70% generally for our events. Even for our 3,000 person, event, we had 3,000 people register for that event and we had about 2,300 people show up. So pretty, we were pretty impressed with that turnout rate. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And I would have expected the opposite as well. So that's, yeah. that's been a really interesting trend for us to watch too. Um, that's it for the, for the discussion today. David, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this. You can tell everyone uh, in the audience really enjoyed it as well. Um, for everyone looking to get a recording, the easiest way is to go to meetup.com slash bog and just subscribe and, and the recording will, will, will be available um, uh, right there. So um, again, thanks again, David, for your time. Uh, and hopefully we can get you back uh, someday and we'll, we'll talk about things in a post-pandemic world. That would be interesting to check in and see which of these predictions are coming true. So really appreciate you uh, having me. Um, for any of you who want to join our community, just search CMX Hub. Um, you can find our website. We have a Facebook group. We have a Slack group. Um, I hope you'll come join us at CMX Summit. It's free. That's going to be October 5th to 7th. Um, we're, gonna, we're expecting close to 10,000 people at that event. And we'll have lots and lots of amazing community builders speaking there. So yeah, we'd love to have you all in our community as well. And Greg, I hope you get to jump that fence and jump into that pool. I might do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Take care. Thanks, everybody.